as we continue in the book of Acts. We spent four weeks looking at the healing in the temple. Four weeks at, at looking at various aspects of what God did in the healing of the temple from chapter 3 and chapter 4 all the way to verse 31. That was a huge, amazing swath of scripture with an amazing miracle that led to the gospel being presented and thousands coming to know Jesus, but also persecution and a choice for the body of Christ, whether to stand for Christ or to compromise and back down. And so we're, this week we're going to look at verses 32 and 33 in the next part that leads into another section of scripture that relates to God's community as it grows and some of the challenges and difficulty that they're going to face. So let's begin in Acts 4, 32 through 33. It says, Now the large group of those who believe were of one heart and mind, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own or her own. But instead, they held everything in common. And the apostles were giving testimony with great power to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all. So as we've seen in the past, that is in Acts chapter 2, we saw that there were the community of faith and their possessions were talked about. Now, many have misconstrued, twisted scripture in thinking this is communism. It isn't. Uh, we know communism doesn't work. Every time they try to use it, communism doesn't work. That is, there's no property ownership. The government takes over everything. You know, we've seen that movie before, the USSR, Chinese communism, Pol Pot in uh, Cambodia, the killing fields, etc., etc. Communism just does not work. So what they're talking about here is something quite different. It is uh, has to do with purpose. It has to do with what they were doing in that they were using what they had to love one another, to meet needs, real needs, and to spread the gospel. Does that make sense? So they were using it, so it's there, but possessions were to be used for the common purpose of loving one another and spreading the gospel of Christ and not for self-indulgence. And those scriptures I give you show that, that they were using real scriptural principles and what they were doing. Communism does not. So I just wanted to briefly touch on it because verse 32 touches on it. We're going to take up a little bit deeper next week on that section from verse 32 into chapter 5. We're going to look at the church community and finances. And we're going to see how the early church had to deal with that in community of faith. So in this case, what were they doing? Remember, we talked about this. There were lots of visitors at Pentecost that came that should have left within less than a week or a week. They'd be there for Pentecost or Shavuot. They'd be there, and then they'd go back to all their homelands. And they mention what all their homelands are in Acts chapter 2. All of those homelands they would have gone back to, and the population would have went back to normal in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. But not so in this case. At least 3,000 or more were still hanging out. And now, uh, what are you going to do with them? They don't live there. So that's, that's beholden on those who do live there or do have uh, tracts of land or whatever to be able to sell it or somehow raise money to be able to support these people while they're there, while they're learning the faith, while they're getting you know, kind of a crash course in what it took three and a half years for the disciples to kind of get, get on board with and, and the event of the Pente day of Pentecost to try to give these guys the faith, to be able to help them learn the body of belief and, and, and practices and following Jesus after they came to know Jesus. And so that's what it should be for us today. So we should do whatever it takes to build up the body of Christ, to encourage and to disciple and to love one another. And that's what they were thinking, but also in spreading the faith as well. So using your, your possessions, that includes your finances. So they had that. They understood that. No one had to tell them. No one put a gun to their head. No one, 
I mean, it was part of the culture, but it was also part of Scripture. I mean, they just looked at Scripture. They looked at what Jesus said. I'm sure the disciples reiterated these verses here that are up there. But today, uh, this week, the focus is going to be more on this, verse 33. And it says, And the apostles were giving testimony with great power, or powerful testimony, to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on them all, all on the whole community. There was a benefit of them giving powerful testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't say giving powerful testimony of the crucifixion of Jesus or of his burial or of his life. Why is the focus here on the resurrection? So when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, they're testifying of their own experience. There were two in particular that ran to the empty tomb and looked in and said, whoa, we verify the tomb is empty. John and Peter, they ran. But you know, the women already knew this, those women who were there. But they were all testifying of their personal experience with the facts of the resurrection, not just the person of Jesus, but the facts surrounding Jesus. So it's good to know God's crime scene in this case. Now, that's also a book, and I would encourage you to get it. It, it really familiarizes you with the forensics based upon an atheist scientific detective who is a forensic scientist who eventually came to Christ because of the evidence. He's a detective doing cold cases. And he said, you know, I could probably do that with this. Prove these crazy Christians that they're wrong. And in, in that real in-depth study, he did the same thing. He found Christ. He used both scientific and historical data, just like you would with a crime scene. It's like TSI, not CSI, tomb scene investigation, instead of crime scene investigation. Was there a crime? Well, yes. There was high treason against the Roman Empire if somebody stole the body. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to go over it real quick. So here are the facts. When you have to bear witness to the resurrection, you have to have your facts straight. Remember we talked about how the disciples in front of the Sadducees, when they were being persecuted, they were brought after being put in jail, they had to testify, so to speak, and, hey, what name are you doing this in? You know, healing this man. And they said, Jesus. But they were factual in everything they brought before them. Factual. Got to get the, the your ducks in the row. They were factual. So crucified and dead, this Jesus of Nazareth. So that tells you right there, there had to be a Jesus of Nazareth. There had to be. And he was crucified. Well, the Romans record everything. There are docket files of everything. And then there's follow-up from Central Command back in Rome about what you're doing in these various provinces, if you did it right or not. Eventually, there's auditing. Did you know that? This is how, I mean, this governmental system that they had, they had their ducks in a row. There was corruption, yes. But some of these things, ducks in a row. Where do we get habeas corpus from? You ever heard of that? That means, you know, you have to show, prove the body, so to speak. You have to have your time with evidence, uh, with those who accuse you and all that. Well, they did this whole trial with Jesus very incorrectly, according to Roman standards. We still use those Roman standards. That's why we have Latin use for, you know, habeas corpus and many jurisprudence kinds of things, which, again, is another Latin term. So Rome never really died. She just morphed a little. Did Rome ever die? Yeah, she did. But uh, she became something else. So crucified, dead, Jesus of Nazareth, and it was recorded by the Roman government. I'm going to tell you why we know it was recorded. And then you have tomb. The tomb uh, did have an imperial seal on it. And the, the Jewish leaders made sure that that was sealed because those crazy disciples might steal the body and make it look like they stole it. But really, make it look like not that they stole it, but that Jesus rose from the dead. You know, and they'll maybe make somebody else up to be Jesus. I don't know how you'd do that. Um, but they had this fear that because this Messiah guy, Jesus, was preaching that he's going to rise from the dead. So that shows you right there. It wasn't just the disciples and those who were kind of hearers 
of what Jesus was predicting about his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection at the hands of the Jews by the Romans. But the Jewish officials themselves knew about it. It wasn't hidden. So when Jesus predicted this stuff about, hey, there's going to be a time when I'm going to go and be crucified, but then on the third day I'm going to rise from the dead. Uh, it wasn't just the disciples. It wasn't in a corner. It was well known enough that they would push Pilate to get an imperial seal upon that stone. And there is a penalty. If you break it before expiration, they would have an expiration. So many months or forever or whatever. And, and after that, who cares? You know. But there's an expiration, some sort of. So that was common practice if you ever put a seal on something. Can't open this letter, this communication that goes from Rome to, to the governor. Can't open it. You know, like, don't open till Christmas, you know. But in this case, if you open it, you're dead. <laughs> so the same thing. But you find out three days, almost four days later, huh, it's empty. What's going on? Wait a minute. Didn't we just seal that tomb? How can this happen? We had guards around there. Next, the disciples claim that they've been with Jesus alive for 40 days. And they're talking about it to others. They claim this. So these are facts. And then there were rumors that somehow the disciples stole the body. Either they overcame the guards <laughs> or, or they came and snuck in and stole the body while the guards were sleeping. Now, of course, those two scenarios are ridiculous. But uh, there's no way that could have happened because if each one of those guards could take on at least two or 12, depending on who they were. But they were trained military guys that could take on more than one person who's non-military. So if you're a farmer, a fisherman, a tax collector, you know, some kind of politician kind of guy, just a normal non-military person, uh, you wouldn't want to go against even one of those guards. I mean, he'd kill you and then your family. <laughs> I mean, that's how powerful these guys were. They were trained military killers. The other thing is, if you're asleep on duty, there has to be at least one guy awake. And that's common military practice everywhere. Somebody has to watch while the others are sleeping. Sometimes they'd have two. Make sure the other one didn't fall asleep. But if they both fell asleep, then what do you do, right? But there was some sort of practice that you couldn't fall asleep if you were you were designated to stay awake. That didn't mean that the rest of the guards could be sleeping. They could. So regardless, <laughs> guard, regardless, um, if if the disciples came in, could they have stolen the body? And of course, the answer is no. There's just no way. But also the threat over the head of every person that would, I mean, you'd have. That'd be very, very difficult to move that stone without making any noise to not wake up somebody. But the other side is you're moving it and you're breaking that seal. Well, it's a death penalty if they catch you. So these disciples, I'm sure, would never even have crossed their mind to go steal that body. That would have been the farthest Thing from their minds. In fact, they were cowards right now. They were hiding somewhere and they were thinking, man, if they got Jesus, they're going to come and get us next. So the state of mind is already there. It's good to present this when you're ever presenting this to those who are not saved and they're inquisitive about the gospel. This is central. And, and the reason why I bring this up is these guys are talking about their own personal experience with the resurrected Christ. But Paul did too, and he wasn't at the empty tomb. He was a little bit later, and he experienced the resurrected Christ. And look what happened to him. So the question is, how can our testimony of the power of Christ's resurrection in changing our lives personally be helpful to those around us today? We were not personal witnesses there, but yet we are called to give powerful testimony of the resurrection of Jesus, just as much as the apostles. Because the apostles were examples to the rest of the flock. Those guys who came to Christ, those 3,000, maybe the two or 5,000 later, or whatever it is, 8,000 people, none of those folks were there at the empty tomb. None of those folks dealt for 40 days with Jesus, like those 12 apostles or 11 apostles, right? But they were being an example to all of those people so that when it's time for them to go back to their homelands, they can do the same there. 
So I just want to put that in your mind and your heart. How can Christ's powerful resurrection impact our lives so that we too can be that powerful testimony of the resurrection, bearing witness to the resurrection of Christ to others today? May the Holy Spirit teach us and open our hearts and minds to that. So I leave you with that question, and then we go on to the question. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is a lie, it's a fraud, it's fake, not real, not true. You see, the central importance of the resurrection to Christianity is that important. Because all the players back then, and even people now, will not argue with you. There are a very few amount of people, some of them are hardened, militant atheists, but don't have their facts straight, that Jesus didn't even exist. But the scholarship is there for like 2,000 years to explain that, yeah, there was a real Jesus of Nazareth, and he was really crucified. I'll give you a link there, uh, or actually a research project for you, to look up Octa Pilati, and I'll go back to the screen prior, about these four facts. On your sheet there, on your notes, it says, Google Google this, Acta Pilati, so it's A-C-T-I, P-I-L-A-T-E-T-I, not Pilati is like the, the exercise, but Pilati. Acta Pilati is, is uh, Roman Latin, which means the acts of Pilate. The Roman documents that were recorded under Augustus Caesar back in Rome that are in the in Caesar Augustus' library of all the various provinces. Those still exist today, by the way. They are still guarded by the Roman Catholic Church, but they are real recorded facts. And just to give you a hint, that's why I put Justin Martyr there, Justin Martyr in an address in 170 AD, another Roman document that almost everybody, you can Google it and read through it. I mean, it's a lot of stuff. But he was a senator from North Africa. And he was a Gentile, and he came to Christ after he was a senator. And he references Octopilati to prove that there was a person named Pilate, to prove the time period, and to prove that this Jesus was real, and he was crucified under the hands of Pilate, and that Pilate initiated an investigation of the empty tomb. He explains this. Forensic detective investigation with the guards, with all the players. And he, he investigates this. And so he brings this out to the Senate to show that Christianity is not some pagan, uh, just a cult somewhere or a subcult of Judaism, but it can stand on its own as its own religion and it should be protected under, under all the laws that would protect other religions. That's what he was going for. Instead of having this governmental level persecution, he was laying claim to this. Now, eventually he was killed for his faith. That's why he's called Justin Martyr. But you look at this, and this is a senator, and you have real Roman government documents. That's why I'm saying he's referencing the documents. So when Jesus was crucified, it was recorded. So again, anything God does... In history, when he intervenes in history, he will leave historically verifiable traces always, either archaeological or some historical reference. There's always a juxtaposition, well, some sort of bringing together of all of these various uh, historical references. So those who don't care, those who do care, and those who are against will all say that Jesus existed, that the, this person was a criminal or something, and he was crucified, somehow he was crucified, and he was laid into a tomb that was sealed. Those facts are undeniable. The other fact is the tomb is empty. Nobody argues about the tomb being empty. Do you follow? So that's why I bring up Acta Pilati. These are real governmental documents that still exist today, and if you have enough uh, clout, I guess, or PhDs, you can actually go and research them and see them, see the documents. Amazing, huh? So again, this is not a leap of faith that's a blind leap of faith. 
Yes, I don't rely upon those, but it does confirm the word. I would expect this. If the Bible is true as a predictive model, learn that word, predictive model. If I were looking at the Bible and say, if I if this is really true, I would expect, what would I expect? I would expect that there would be Roman documents. I would expect that there would be traces of all this evidence everywhere outside of the Bible. I would expect it. It wouldn't just be some philosophy that somebody's saying. And that's why I'm saying, bearing witness powerfully of the resurrection of Jesus. It did not happen in a hole somewhere. There was a lot of evidence. And there's still the evidence today. And we're going to talk about that a little more. So if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then Christianity is a lie. It's a fraud, fake, not real, and not true. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, then of course it's all true. All of it. Because Jesus quoted from basically the whole Testament. And he commissions his disciples basically to write and to live the New Testament. So basically the whole Bible rises or falls upon the veracity of the resurrection of Jesus. See, it's not all of those other facts that are in dispute. It's the resurrection of Jesus that's in dispute. The other facts, including his crucifixion and empty tomb, but why is it empty? So let's look at, in the back of your sheet there, it has 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 20. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, the good message that I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you were saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And he's going to talk about what he means by that. If you believed in vain. Think the Sadducees. What didn't they believe in? Ah, he's going to touch on that. The infection of the Sadducees. That's why they're sad, you see. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, or, or Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. That hold up in court. Most of whom remain until now. But some have fallen asleep. So if you have any questions, I can give you their names and numbers. And you can go follow up. Because most of them are still alive. Okay, They were witness to the resurrected Christ. That Christ appeared to them after he rose from the dead. So if you want, want their names and numbers. Verse 7, Then he appeared to James, which is his brother, half-brother, Jesus' is half-brother, and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. You ever feel like you're out of place sometimes? I know Yvette does sometimes. Think, you know, I was born in the wrong century or born in the wrong time period or something. Uh, that's kind of what he's talking about here. It's like he, he, I think he's thinking, you know, it'd been nice if I was with those original 12. That's really what he's saying. But he is included, I would agree, that he was the, the 12th apostle choice. For I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. That kept him humble. Imagine sometimes he was thinking that. You know, all the bad things I did against the church. I remember some of the things I did as a scoffer and a skeptic. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me or within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and so you believed. So he's talking about the gospel that he preaches to both Jews and Gentiles. It's the same thing. Now, he sums it up. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and then he raised on the third day. Okay, that, that's a summation, bullet point. In some cases, he went back three Sabbaths to explain this to a synagogue. It wasn't just pass out a track and it was done. In many cases, he spent time with people. If he found somebody who was willing and open and talk about and then they invited him back, he'd come back to elaborate more. Because you have to explain, hey, this Jesus is real. How does he tie into reality, into my life? All of those things, you see? So it isn't always that. Sometimes a track is a good opening. Sometimes those flyers are your initial thing. But if they, 
if you notice that the Holy Spirit is working and wash and and opens up and they want to talk more, be there for them. And if you need to meet two or three more times, do that. God is doing something. Just go where the doors are open. And that's what he was talking about here. Now, verses uh, 12 through 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. Now he's going to go into a, a weird premise that some people have believed, like the Sadducees. See, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. So somehow that weird teaching, when he preached the gospel that Jesus rose from the dead, somehow that was going on there in Corinth in that local church family. So he says, now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, now he's going to, talk, he's going to use pure logic here. If A equals B and A plus B equals C, you know, you know how that goes, you know? So he's going to use some sort of almost pure mathematical logic. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Remember that vain, if you had believed in vain? He's talking about if they had believed in Christ, but they had a hard time with the resurrection. Well, then they believed in vain. They weren't really saved. You see, it's empty. That's what vain is, worth, worthless or empty. And our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. It's worthless. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who have also fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied. Now, if you just were left there, and that's it. This is what the atheists wish to prove. But it's also which those Islamists wish to prove. and Buddhists, and Hindus, skeptics, agnostics, those of the Baha'i faith. Every religion in the world would like Christianity to go away because none of them have a Savior who rose from the dead. <clears throat> you see, if Jesus rises from the dead, then the Bible is true, and every religion that is not of the Bible is false. So they're all rejoicing at this point. They're like reading this. Yeah, woo-hoo-hoo. Yes, those Christians, they're believing a lie. And we are to be most pitied if Christ did not rise from the dead. You're just like every other religion who has some leader that you would go and venerate at the tomb. Right? Gautama Buddha, they go to his tomb. They know where it is. He died. All of these religious leaders have died. And their bodies and bones are still there. <clears throat> but verse 20 is, is the victory. Verse 20, it says, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So what we see here is the doctrinal side of the historical event of what the apostles were powerfully proclaiming and testifying about. Is that, Jesus did rise from the dead. We are witnesses, and our lives are witnesses of it. Their boldness, their strong commitment, their articulation, all of those things, and the miraculous that was going on, was all to confirm that everything they are saying is true. And then those who are coming to faith, all of that was undeniable. And so it is with us, and we leave with this question. Why is the resurrection so important to the truthfulness of the gospel? Why is that? Can you today powerfully testify about the resurrection of Jesus Christ? If push came to shove and the rubber met the road, could you articulate that? Could you help the person who you are witnessing to Steer them to the centrality of this. 
the reality that Jesus existed, that he was crucified, could you help them see that that tomb was empty for a reason, that he rose from the dead just like he said? So that's our challenge today. As we proclaim the gospel, as we want to share with others, it isn't just come to Jesus and your life will be good. It isn't just come to Jesus and you get the goodies and it's rainbow lollipops and sunshine. It isn't just come to Jesus and God makes your life better. Um, in many cases, like any of these apostles, their life was not better. They experienced much persecution. And you see how they were died, uh, killed. I mean, they died horribly. Um, I mean, they tried to kill John. I mean, they tried to boil him in oil. And he's, Can you imagine how disfigured you'd be? And how horrible. But you survive that? I mean, so that's not the, the issue. The issue is, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and he rose from the dead. He didn't just stay died. He rose from the dead. He didn't, he didn't stay dead. Yep. So for us, the challenge is, to allow God to powerfully testify through us. But that requires a changed life. How impactful is the resurrection of Jesus in your life? And I'm talking to myself just as much. I'm not any better. I need that powerful transformation more and more every day of Christ in me, which is the hope of glory. Amen? So let's, uh, let's worship God. Let's sing this last song. Let's Praise him for how wonderful and powerfully changed our lives are because of him.